There was an old-time evangelist in the late 19th, early 20th century by the name of Billy Sunday. Some of you have heard of Billy Sunday, but famously, Billy Sunday said these words, quote, churches don't need new members half so much as they need the old bunch made over, unquote. <laughs> Let me say that again. Churches don't need new members half so much as they need the old bunch made over. And it's a simple notion. Often you will clean your house before you invite people into it. And so also, that seems to be the pattern of God. He engages in a house cleaning of His church before He sends revival. He cleans His house often in preparation for bringing new people in. And I would argue that the church in America needs that type of house cleaning. I think we've spent decades pursuing and working toward a holy culture outside of the church walls. And not just individuals, but whole churches and whole denominations have dedicated themselves to things like the moral majority and the Christian coalition and even to focus on the family. Not that it all, any of those organizations have ever, they're not bad in and of themselves. But I think what it's done is for the church in America to lead many churches and even don denominations not so much to see themselves as witnesses for Christ Jesus in the world, but as culture warriors who are going to fight for Christ in the culture. And, and maybe among other results that has led to this, that there has been a diminishment or an obscuring of the spiritual mission of the church. And so churches had devoted themselves to transforming the culture or to reclaiming America for Christ rather than devoting themselves to the work of gathering and perfecting the saints, rather than devoting themselves to calling people out of the world and into our churches. But there's been a collateral effect that I want to talk about today that I think has been even more dangerous and that has been even more harmful to our witness to the world. And that is that while the church has been so devoted toward trying to make the world a holy place inside our churches, materialism has run rampant, sexual immorality has risen. We have watched in evangelical churches in America a slow fade from worship to entertainment to narcissism. The last several generations have overseen the death of the evening worship service in our churches, a decline across the board in Sunday school attendance, and a shrinking pool of foreign missionaries, all of which testify to the fact that there's something wrong, not in the world, but in our churches. Could it be that in trying to make the world holy, the church has neglected its own holiness? Could it be that Billy Sunday was right after all, that churches don't need new members half so much as they need the old bunch made over? Well, today we're going to focus on the holiness of the church by asking and by answering this question, uh, where should the church pursue holiness? It seems a simple question, but it seems a confusing answer within the churches in our nation. Where should the church pursue holiness? And I want to suggest that the answer is not in the world, but in the church. The church should pursue holiness not in the world, but in the church. And this is a series on the church, and we've talked about how Jesus is the head of the church. We've talked about how He's given the church particular tools, the word, sacraments, and prayer, to do a particular job, to gather and perfect the saints, and that He sends His Holy Spirit to empower our use of those tools that He might grow His kingdom here on earth. This, like those sermons, is a topical sermon, and I say that because normally what we do is preach verse by verse through books of the Bible, but, but we're talking about a series in the church, and today we're going to talk about the holiness of the church beginning in Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. You'll find that printed on your bulletin. It should also be on the screen before you. And so as we begin by reading out of Matthew 7, 3 through 5, ask yourself this question, where should the church pursue holiness? And as we read together, let's remember that this is God's holy word. Jesus asks, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, 
and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. And so if we ask, if we ask the question, where should the church pursue holiness, I want to suggest, firstly, not in the world. We, we ought not to be about the business of trying to make the world holy. And if you ask why, I think that there are three very clear reasons why we're not to be about the business, primarily, of pursuing holiness in the world. Firstly, our vision for the world's holiness is clouded by our own sins. Our vision for the world's holiness is clouded by our own sins. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Now, Jesus is speaking to individuals, certainly, but the principle that He teaches works itself out in churches and denominations as well. Here's a radical example. I understand it's a radical example. It's not indicative of most churches, but you think of the people from Westboro Baptist Church, the people who walk around protesting at military funerals, holding signs that declare that God hates homosexuals. Okay. Now, these people believe that they are doing the work of the Lord. Now, they've got a beam protruding from their eyes, and they're pointing out other people's sins. So, it doesn't just happen to individuals. It happens to whole churches and denominations. Now, I'm not suggesting that sin is any less sinful because I happen to have a beam in my eye. But it's important to recognize what Jesus is doing. He's not precluding your use of moral discernment. He doesn't say, don't look at the world and see right from wrong. That's not what he's saying, and that's not what I'm saying either. Certainly, you should identify right from wrong, but, but Jesus' teaching does encourage an emphasis on self-evaluation and not so much an emphasis on other evaluation. In other words, I should be more worried about my own log than I am about your speck. And that doesn't just go for individuals, but I think it goes for the church as well. Maybe the church also should attend to the logs in its own eyes more than we attend to the speck that we see in the eyes of the world. And so, if we ask, well, where should the church pursue holiness, I want to suggest not in in the world, firstly because oftentimes the log in our eye uh, blurs our vision in necessarily seeing what needs to happen in the world. But I think secondly, the second reason why we shouldn't be about that business is the world by definition hates holiness. The world by definition hates holiness. Consider what Jesus says in John 15 verses 18 and 19, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You know this to be true. Those of you who are believers, for any length of time, you know this to be true. Fallen men stand at enmity with God. They live in slavery to their sin. They are by nature children of wrath, and they are unable to desire holiness. Now, biblically, you know this, that holiness is not simply refraining from overt or outward sin, but holiness is something that is wrought inside you by the power of the Holy Spirit that leads you self-consciously to consecrate yourself to serve and glorify Jesus Christ in your thought, word, attitude, deed, actions with your body, with the whole nine yards, and it's wrought in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the church cannot accomplish that through social action. The church can't accomplish that through civic action. The church can't accomplish that out in the world, but instead the church calls men and women out of the world and into the kingdom of Christ because it's in the kingdom of Christ, that is the church, where the Holy Spirit is actively empowering and using the word, sacraments, and prayer to bring about the consecration of a people who are devoted to Christ Jesus eternally. This is, this is what is, is happening and so, if, if we ask, well, where should the church pursue holiness, I would, I would answer not in the world because oftentimes our own sins obscure us from seeing what the world needs, but secondly, because, because the world hates and always has hated holiness, but, but thirdly, it's just not the church's job. It's just not the church's job. Consider what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. I wrote to you, he's writing to the believers at Corinth, to the church, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. 
not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But, I, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, or drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Now, one of the things that we can take away from this is, is simply this, that, that the Apostle Paul expects the world to act like the world, and he expects the church to act like the church. Said differently, he demands holiness within the church. He doesn't demand holiness within the world. After all, why would Paul expect unregenerate men to possess either the desire or the ability to pursue holiness? Why would he expect that? He clearly doesn't expect that. Now, you may pause at this point, and I want you to ask a very important question. It goes like this, Pastor, does that mean the church shouldn't do anything to prevent rampant immorality in society? Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. I do think the church has some things it should be doing. We've gone over this before, so I'll keep this relatively brief. The church should proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reason for that is that gospel proclamation not only leads to salvation, but then it also leads to the transformation of the individual from a hater of holiness to one who pursues holiness. So, we ought to be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and secondly, the church ought to be equipping transformed individuals to serve Jesus in their various callings. We've, we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Many of your callings, your vocations and avocations will put you, redeemed men and women, will put you in a position to, to restrain sin and change laws, to alleviate hunger, to prevent abortion to promote care for your neighbors, to ensure law and order, and really in a thousand other ways to help prevent immorality and promote morality within society. But, but none of those activities can make an unregenerate person holy because true holiness results from what? From, from salvation and not from social activity. And Salvation only happens when the Holy Spirit calls a person out of the world and into the church through the gospel. And so, laws are important. Laws, whether they're civil laws or they're cultural laws or they're social laws, whatever laws matter because laws help to restrain sin, and laws can impose upon a human being outwardly conformity to moral behavior but only Jesus can make a person moral from the inside out. Only Christ can transform a heart and make a person eager for holiness. And so, the church should preach the gospel. The church should equip the saints. And thirdly, the church should pray, pray relentlessly, pray for God to bless the preaching of Christ, for Him to seek and save the lost through the preaching of the gospel, and to equip the found so that you all are prepared to go out into your various callings in the manifold ways God has called you and have an impact upon a world that is covered in darkness, to be, to be light in the darkness and salt that preserves the rot in the world. What that, what that means is this. There's a biblical emphasis, and I hope that you see this, the church must focus on calling people out of the world more than it focuses on trying to change the world to make it appealing to the church. This is what we're called to do. So, where should the church pursue holiness? Well, not in the world. But if not in the world, then where? In the church. The church is called to pursue holiness in the church. Why? Well, let me give you two reasons why we should be about the business of pursuing holiness in the church. Firstly, because the head of the church is holy. The head of the church is holy. You know what the Scripture teaches in Colossians 1 and verse 18. It says that Jesus is the head of the body of the church. He alone is head of the church. 
And Hebrews 4.15 says that he is without sin, and 2 Corinthians 5.21 describes him as one who had no sin, and his church is supposed to pursue his holiness, even as he himself is holy and, it, and was fully consecrated unto the, the will and glory and service of his Father, so also the church should be pursuing holiness. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And that pursuit of holiness can't simply be something that is left to individual believers. It must grip churches, whole congregations. It must grip the visible institutional church on earth. Consider in Ephesians 5, Paul is talking about husbands and wives and how they're supposed to relate to each other, but in that, he gives us a very, a very particular statement about how Christ is interacting with the church and what he expects. And he says this, "'Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might set word.'" church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy. Jesus is making his church, which is his body, his bride, holy. He's our holy head, our holy husband, and he is pursuing holiness in his bride. Consider even John's description in Revelation chapter 21 of the new Jerusalem. He says in Revelation 21 and verse 2, I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as what? A bride adorned for her husband. The new Jerusalem is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And in verses 9 through 11, John continues and says, an angel spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And that holy city is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. It is what? The church. And so if you ask, well, why should the church be pursuing holiness inside the church, in here and not out in the world? Firstly, because the head of the church is holy. And He also is pursuing our holiness, so we should be about that business ourselves. But secondly, the church's holiness or lack thereof either strengthens or weakens its witness to Jesus. Let me say that again. The church's holiness or lack thereof either strengthens or weakens its witness to Jesus. You remember Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. And we're not simply witnessing that He saves, but by our lives, our transformed lives, by the way that we live that is different than the people of the world around us, we witness not simply that He saves, but after He saves, He doesn't leave you in your sin. He begins to change you into His own likeness. He changes your priorities. He changes how you think about work and marriage and family and money and possessions and the world. He changes people. But if there's no holiness in the church, then we're testifying at best that he sells fire insurance. But he doesn't actually change people because those people in the church continue to live in the same way that the world lives. And so Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says this about the church and about his ministry. He says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. In other words, we live lives that are fully consecrated unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's what Paul describes here. That's what it looks like. And he says that he has a goal in verse 3. He says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. You see, the reason he says that is because the primary work of the church in reference to the world is to call people out of the world and into a place that is actually different from the world. But if the primary work of the church becomes calling on the world to fix itself, if the primary work of the church becomes pursuing racial reconciliation in the world, if the primary work of the church becomes alleviating poverty in the world, if the primary work of the church becomes transforming the culture of the world, then really what the church has done is become faithless to do what Jesus has specifically called us to do, which is to call people out of the world and into the marvelous light of the kingdom of God where people are changed and transformed from the inside out. And if the church is not pursuing holiness within her walls, how effective will our witness be anyway? Who leaves the darkness of the world if all they will find is darkness in the church? Charles Spurgeon once said this, in proportion as a church is holy, in that proportion will its testimony for Christ be powerful. Where should the church pursue holiness? Not in the world, but in the church. Many of you know the name A.W. Tozer. He was a theologian and a writer, and he said these words, and I'm convicted by this, maybe you will be as well. He said, quote, a Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself, but a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. I think the church in America has for some time been hard on others and easy on itself. I, for one, think that needs to change. The Scripture calls us to look inside the walls of the church for sin and idolatry, that doesn't mean that we can't use moral discernment and recognize things in our culture that are right and wrong. I'm not saying that. But it does mean this. We are to be far harder on Twin Oaks Presbyterian Church than we are on leftists, than we are on cultural elites, than we are on LGBTQ activists. I'm not saying any of those people are themselves without sin. Please don't hear me say that. It's not wrong to exercise moral discernment, and the church of Jesus Christ must equip people for biblical living and equip the saints to engage in all the callings that God has given, and those callings ultimately will address all those groups, and it will equip you to address them properly with compassion and with love in truth because there is nothing antagonistic between that which is true and that which is loving we are to be those who speak the truth in love and not use the truth as a battering ram. But, but this, our eyes should seek and point out and try to destroy our own sins before we go after anyone else. Consider what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 29 and 30. And before I read these words, I want you to know that what he's using here is is hyperbole, and he's talking about that which is spiritual and not that which is physical, so don't go home and physically do this. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. Now, Christ did not say, go and saw off your sinful neighbor's hand. He tells you to saw off your own, to be so serious about your sin that you would even contemplate a relentless sawing through flesh and bone to do away with that which leads you to dishonor your Lord. And so Paul says to the church, at Colossae, to the church 
He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church in Colossians 3, 5 to 10. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And these words are written for the church, for those who are inside the walls, as it's written for those of you who claim Christ as Savior. And consider the letters to the churches, not to individuals, but to the churches that, that John receives in the book of Revelation. Those, those letters are letters in which Jesus does not fault the church for its failure to transform the Roman Empire for Christ. The church doesn't get faulted for that. It doesn't get faulted for failing to address the world's sins. It doesn't get faulted for, over, for not overthrowing corruptions. But, but these letters address the sins of the church within the church and demand holiness within the body. He addresses us. He addresses you. He addresses me. Consider throughout the Scripture that this is the pattern that were given over and over again. Noah did not attempt to make his culture holy. Rather, he said a judgment is coming, and he called people to leave the world, get into the ark, and be saved. And they all refused his preaching. Moses did not go to Pharaoh and preach for the moral reformation of Egypt, but he announced that God was calling a people out of Egypt and to himself to be his particular people. The Old Testament prophets did not rail against the covenant-breaking and sin of the Ethiopians. They railed against the covenant-breaking and sin of the Israelites, and they sought the holiness of Israel and not of Assyria. John the Baptist did not call the Edomites to the mat for their sins. He called the Jews to the mat for their sins, to those who were in the covenant community, and he demanded of them repentance and holiness within the community of God. Jesus made no attempt to overturn or overthrow or change the very Roman legal system that murdered him and later would execute Paul and Peter as well. He made no attempt to abolish poverty or slavery or corruption, but he preached that a kingdom was coming and you had to leave this world to go to that kingdom to find salvation from your God, and neither Peter nor Paul nor John nor James command the church to go out into the world to make it holy and to spend the resources of the church to try to make other people feel bad so that they will feel morally inferior as though that will change them. But they told us to preach Christ. For the transformation of people, calling them out of the world and into the church where the Holy Spirit is at work. But here the church has to pursue holiness in itself. And I want you to understand this because I've been convicted, I am convicted that, that Christians, that churches in America exhausted ourselves trying to control the morality of people who don't even profess faith in Christ. And we have exhausted ourselves and spent billions of dollars to do things that God has not called us to do while neglecting what we've been called to do. So here is what I think from God's Word we should be about the business of doing. Firstly, start with you. You start with you. I will start with me. Ask yourself, am I consecrated unto Jesus? Do I love Him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Am I pursuing Him? For Him who died for me, it, have, I, have I taken my marriage and laid it before Him and said, I want to consecrate this unto you so that, so that in my marriage I am I am pursuing holiness. It's all for you and my parenting and my work or my homework in, in, with my body and my mind from my heart, all of me, all for Christ, all the time. And, 
are you doing that? Have you prayed that? Have you sought the, the power which can only be divine to enable you to do that? Are you asking for conviction of your sin and for a tender conscience, for true repentance that leads to consecration so that, so that you can glorify Jesus? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to grant you the ability to remove the log from your own eye? That's hard to do. Are, are, are you even willing to pray that He would help you identify your hand that you need to saw off because it's getting in the way of you pursuing the holiness of your God? Are you willing to do that? Are, are you willing to do this to turn your moral scrutiny inward? Instead of turning it outward to society that is so lost and dark as though, as though it should be anything other than lost and dark, to turn your moral scrutiny inward. After all, James says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. So I would say this, start with you and then move to the church, not the big C church, not the church everywhere in America, move to Twin Oaks Presbyterian Church and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what are our sins, what are our idols, what are we doing that we ought not to do, what should, what should, we, what should we leave undone that we're currently chasing, where are our failures of holiness, ask for conviction, ask for conviction for me for the ministry staff, for the elders and deacons, help us to understand and see how we ought to be pursuing Christ more fully. Here's one thing that I think, and I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to say it again, and I know, I know in saying this, I understand people are busy and I understand life, but I want you to hear me out. Last Sunday night, we had an opportunity to gather together as a congregation to pray. A lot of people were nervous. A lot of people were upset. We gathered together as a congregation to pray, and we had 50 or 60 people here to do that. And then the following Tuesday, I would guess 250, 300 people from this congregation were willing to stand in line for an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours in order to vote, but weren't willing to drive 15 minutes and come here and spend an hour praying three days beforehand. That shows that we have a problem, beloved. We are willing and even eager to suffer in order to vote. But we can't be bothered to pray. Start with yourself and then move here, right here in this church where we are to be pursuing holiness and then move on to the church in America and ask for conviction of sin and repentance that goes across denominational lines. Repentance from materialism, silly, selfish, narcissistic, quote-unquote, worship, a lack of sexual purity, gross ignorance of the Bible, fear of man, failure to preach on sin, repentance, judgment, or hell, obsession with the culture, pollution from politics, and, and recently what has to be called a shameful whoring after the demands of social justice, which bear, bears no resemblance to biblical justice. In short, maybe we should clean our house before we go praying for God to bring new people into it. Peter says that it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and I pray that God would send it. And then only after you have addressed you and that only after you have addressed our church and then only after you have addressed the church corporate across this nation, then do, please do, do pray for the church to enjoy the blessings of Christ Jesus as we seek to gather and perfect His saints. And I know, I know you well enough to know you want the Lord to use this church to seek and save the lost, to sanctify the found, to build a holy community that is intent on glorifying Jesus Christ in our bones. I know you want it. 
So, in order to remove every obstacle to that happening, I would invite you to join me in pursuing and striving for and purposely seeking holiness because we are Christ's bride and He calls us to holiness. I think Billy Sunday was right. Churches don't need new members half so much as they need the old bunch made over, and that includes me. It's not the world that needs to be holy, beloved. It can't be. There's no way it can be, but the church must be holy. We must, must pursue full consecration to serve and glorify the Lord Jesus. So pray for it and pursue it and join me in repentance and in a re-consecration to Christ in holiness. And then let's see what our God will do. Will you please pray with me? Our gracious God and Father, we pray that you would grant to us the gift of repentance. Father, will you give it to each person in this place and each person who is joining us online? Will you grant us each a tender heart and a tender conscience that we might be quick to repent and to consecrate ourselves to pursue holiness for the glory of Christ? Father, we pray that you would reveal to us as a church body our sins. We pray that you would grant us a tender conscience and an eager desire to do the hard work of mortifying our sins, even cutting through flesh and bone if that were necessary to bring glory to Christ. Father, we pray for the church across our nation that you would cause repentance from its selfishness and folly, narcissism and disobedience, that we might be more concerned with our own holiness than with pointing out the specks in the eyes of our culture. And Father, as we do this work, we pray that you would bless the means of grace, that you would send your Holy Spirit to gather and to perfect your saints, both to seek those who are lost and to sanctify those who are found, so that as we call men and women out of darkness, truly this place would be a place of marvelous light. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is our Savior. Amen.